Good morning, and good luck. And welcome back to Good Luck with Gino. I'm your host, Gino the Ghost. <laughs> That's the first time we've done that. It sounds great. And we're here for episode 13. And we got a fun one today, everybody. Um, let's talk about my week before we get into the week. Specifically today and what happened on my way over here. So before coming in today, I had to do a little grocery shopping. So I went to Trader Joe's, which is where you go grocery shopping when you're a man of exceptional taste. Now, some may say you go to Whole Foods, right? Overpriced. Erwan, egregiously overpriced. Trader Joe's is kind of that sweet spot of, of value and culture, right? So, so I'm a big TJ's uh, fan. And this is not a sponsored ad, by the way. But I, it could be uh, if they reach out. So I'm checking out. I got a bunch of shit, you know. And in front of me, there's this woman with a cart. And she's got two bananas. Now, this woman may have been homeless. I'm not sure. And if not homeless, she was homeless adjacent. You know what I mean? And she's fishing through her bag to find... It's like 38 cents, I think. Uh, two bananas, you know. And man, she is just fishing through that fucking bag. She is trying to find 38 cents in there. And she finds like a nickel or something. And she's just like... And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to be patient because I'm a man of God, right? And we like to practice patience. And I'm really struggling. And um, now about 46 seconds have passed. And that's a long amount of time to be. So you know what I do? I go, hey, hey, um, you know what? I'd actually like to pay for this. D don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. And she's like, oh, sweetheart. I, no, it's okay. I'm like, no, 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 please. Let me pay. It would make my day to, to pay for this for you. And she's like, oh, my God, that's so sweet. Seriously? I'm like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, take it. You take those bananas and you. And um, she's like, oh, my God, that's so sweet. Thank you. And she walks out and the cashier looks to me and she goes, oh, my God, that was so generous of you. And I said, no, it wasn't. That was really selfish of me because I just couldn't fucking stand there for one more second. And it's worth the 38 cents to just, so, you know, it, it was for, it was for me. Um, and, and I think there's a valuable lesson in there somewhere. I don't know what that lesson is or where it is, but there's one in there somewhere and we're not going to unpack it. So after that, I drop off the groceries and then I realize I want a coffee. So I go to the, this new cafe in Silver Lake because I'm kind of sick of Starbucks and Blue Bottle. I wanted to kind of mix it up. So I tried out this new cafe and I get there and I've got about an hour and a half before this podcast filming. So I got some time to kill. I got some work I got to get done. So I get my latte. It's like fucking $8, you know, and I sit down and I go, oh, uh, what's the Wi-Fi? And the barista says to me, we don't have Wi-Fi here. We want people to talk to each other. To which I said, talk to each other? Ma'am, this is a cafe. I didn't come here to make friends. I'm 31. Okay? I'm not looking to make new friends in the wild. I came here to buy an $8 Chagachino, okay, and get some work done silently by myself. This, I'm not a 12-year-old at McDonald's in the jungle gym, okay? You don't have a Wi-Fi code. How do you not have Wi-Fi? It's like fucking $50. Just get Wi-Fi. <laughs> what, what, are you going to start a revolution to fight back against everybody on their phones? This can't be a profitable model for you guys. Now, I don't say any of this stuff. I think it, though. I'm very annoyed. And additionally, I got to take a piss. So I go to the bathroom. And why does every <laughs> every bathroom at like a cafe or like a Chipotle has like a 12-digit bathroom code to get in? This sounds like a stand-up bit. It's not. And I'm like, <laughs> I go, uh, what's the bathroom code? And she's like, 
six five seven eight six three two like literally like I'm like huh so I'm like okay six five so I try it I get it wrong I'm like I'm sorry <laughs> what's that code again for me and she's like six five seven four three six four six seven eight nine six I'm like okay so I'm like doing a fucking Pythagorean theorem into the thing it doesn't work I'm like Hi, I'm sorry one more time what's that code to the bathroom I, am I in Ocean's Eleven like trying to fucking hack into the safe. <laughs> What's the combination? I had to literally have her, I had to put it in my phone. What is this fucking cafe? I will never be back. No Wi Fi. The fucking code to the bathroom is like I'm breaking into a, a Swiss bank. Anyway. So I went back home. For fucking 20 minutes, you know, fucking sat down and looked at the wall and then I came here. So that was my day. Uh, what happened in the world? Um, there was like a coup in Russia, uh, but it literally lasted like 48 seconds. So we're not going to spend any time on that because it's a nothing burger. Uh, what else happened? The Titanic submarine imploded. Um, I don't know if you know what imploded means. Uh, exploded is when something explodes exteriorly. Uh, what happened with the sub is that it imploded, which means it impl exploded inside, inward. And if you spent any moment on TikTok in the past couple days, you had every influencer pretend to know how that works and have probably explained it to you already. But they basically instantly disintegrated into fish food. And they're gone. So um, rest in peace to one person on that, uh, the kid who was dragged on by his dad. I feel so bad for that fucking kid. He didn't want to go on, but it was Father's Day. So he was like, okay, Dad, I'll go. And now he's dead. And, uh, you know, Stockton Rush, the CEO, like, I, you know, everyone's giving him a lot of shit. I do admire that he was an entrepreneur and was trying to disrupt the submarine business. And I have a couple friends who like have known him and have done some work with him, some media work with him. Uh, he's apparently a nice guy. And, uh, you know, but dude, just kind of do it by yourself, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't have any sympathy for him. I, you know, I, I do feel bad for the people, everyone that died a little bit. Like just, I mean, literally just this much. And if you're if you're listening back home and you're not watching, my index finger and my thumb are maybe a quarter of a millimeter apart, right? And that's how much sympathy I have. Um, I you know I posted a clip where I was talking about it, and I had this lady DM me and was like, you know. It's not funny. I know you're trying to just, you know, make light of it, but it's not funny. People died. And what I said is, you don't get to make that call. You don't get to decide what's funny. Sorry. Now, does that mean that everything is funny? Like every submarine joke is, no. Most of them are not funny because the jokes aren't funny. Any situation, you can find humor in any situation. And that's the job of a funny person to do, right? It's a funny person's job to pinpoint moments of irony and, and the comedy in things. When I die one day, hopefully it's very boring and of old age and I'm like 124 years old or something because we figured out a way to live that long. But I would hope somebody can find some humor in it, you know. Um, and I just think, like, I don't know. Those are my thoughts on that. The, the Netflix <laughs> decided, conveniently, that it's bringing the Titanic back onto their platform in July. They're, they just, I don't know, they just decided, hey, you know what would be a good idea? Yeah, you guys, you know... Of course you're fucking bringing Titanic back. Capitalism, nah. They're going to make a fucking Titanic. They're they're already, I'm telling you right now. There's a movie producer in Hollywood right now working on the Titanic reboot. I mean, they are they are literally 
probably three months into development already. And they just started a few days ago. And they're just fast-tracking this motherfucker, right? <sighs> the good news is they're going to have some new characters. Um, I, you know, what's interesting is a lot of people think, just to stay on the Titanic thing, just a little bit longer, because <laughs> I had an epiphany. Everybody thinks that now they're like, oh, we should send more billionaires down there. Like, oh, man, now nobody's going to want to go to the, the Titanic anymore. And you couldn't be more wrong. I think that this is going to be the beginning of an explosion of tourism for the Titanic. I think there's going to be so many more fucking billionaires and millionaires and rich people that are going to want to go to the bottom of the Titanic. And let me tell you my thought process behind this. Back in the day, Mount Everest was this impossible feat. It was to climb Mount Everest, you had to be one of the fucking the coldest climbers of all time to get to the top. It was hard as fuck, right? And in the mid 90s to the late I think it was mid 90s, all these fucking tourism companies all of a sudden started popping up. And they're like, hey, we'll take your rich, stupid ass to the top if you want, if you give us a bunch of money. We'll tour guide you up to the, to the top of Mount Everest. And one of the first groups of people that did this died. Like, eight of them died. I think one person lived. Uh, there was a book called Into Thin Air. And it was a famous book. It was like, the, I don't know if it was the lone survivor, but a survivor of this incident wrote a book the book exploded. It was huge. And because of that, and this horrible tragedy that everybody was talking about, all these other rich people were like, I want to go to Mount Everest. I could do it. And these uh, tourism exploded for Mount Everest. There's a fucking hit movie into thin air. The, the book was adapted into a movie. Huge movie. Now... Everybody is going to... F Mount Everest looks like the fucking line at Cedar Point to get in. It's just a line of people up the mountain. It's fucking packed. <laughs> like 300 people have died. Tourism has exploded. Because of all the people that are there, it's gotten more dangerous. Because, you know, you already have like, you know, the, 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 the risk of... Um, it's like, what is it, altitude sickness, I think. A lot of people die from altitude sickness and just extreme weather conditions and fucking avalanches. And now you just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. And then you're just sitting there and you're waiting. You're in line. Can you imagine trying to climb Mount Everest and you're in line and you're just waiting in line like you're at fucking Trader Joe's and there's a woman in front of you trying to get changed so she can buy a couple bananas? And she can't find, and there's just hundreds of women trying to pay for bananas in front of you. That's what it's like. And this is what's going to happen with the fucking Titanic. I'm telling you, you think I'm fucking bullshitting? These companies are going to start popping up like crazy. And in, let's call it three years, there's going to be a line of submarines to see the Titanic. It's going to look like the fucking 405 freeway. They're just going to be a line of subs. You, you watch. You watch. What else? Uh, Zuckerberg and Elon Musk are about to have a fucking cage match. The simulation is glitching. We have reached uh, level 9,000 of the simulation. Elon Musk, I don't know how this feud started. I mean, it dates back, I'm sure. You know, a couple of tech billionaires... Um, you know, there's a rivalry there, undoubtedly. So I think Elon Musk made a comment about Zuckerberg, and then somebody was like, cage match? And then he was like, shit, I would. And then Mark Zuckerberg was like, bet, send the Addy. He was like, bet, drop a pin. <laughs> What's up? Zuckerberg was like, what are we doing, dog? And he was like, What's up, dog? And now it's happening, I guess. I just don't care. Like, 
oh, two billionaires are fighting over money, you know, to make more money. It'll be fun to watch them fight, but, like, let's raise the stakes a little bit. You know, you want to make it interesting? Let's fight over pink slips. Winner gets Twitter and Facebook. Huh? That'll fucking spice it up. Whoever wins loses their app and their company to the other person. That'd be the fucking highest grossing event. Are you kidding me? That's like the that's like the fight for attention, currency. You win that. That's a cage fight I would watch. Or or they should fight to the death. That's an I would also watch that. I think we should bring back gladiator fighting. Dude, that'd be what a what a sick way to kick it off too. And people would eat that shit up. People love watching billionaires die. People hate rich people, especially billionaires. I mean, look at the fucking sub thing. It was the everyone's favorite thing to talk about was these <laughs> these fucking idiots that went to the Titanic and died. Fuck billionaires. Eat the rich. Drown the rich. You know? Dude, let's do it, man. Let's bring back fucking cage fighting to the, de- like, gladiator, like, bro. I went to Rome one time and was at the Colosseum and was just watching, like, I could see visions of people fight. I, I, you know, I felt like I was in the Mel Gibson movie, literally. Was that the Mel Gibson? That's not Braveheart. The Russell Crowe movie. Gladiator. Nice. Bring it back. <sighs> My voice sounds a little grovelly today. I sound like I'm doing a voiceover for Diablo 4. Enjoy that. Um, What else did I do? Let's talk art. Let's talk art history. And uh, something I did. I posted a a thread about this uh, on my Twitter and on my Instagram. You guys can check it out. But I bought bought a CryptoPunk for $140,000 a few days ago. Now, you're wondering... What is a crypto punk, probably? And why the fuck did you drop an absorbent amount of money on it? Now, let's dive into the history of of uh, of crypto punks. So, Larva Labs launched crypto punks in 2017. They are among the first, not the very first, but among the first, but the most iconic uh, examples of an NFT, right? So, before you fucking start, NFT scam, I I saw on Fox News that FTX went under and it's all scam. Yeah, shut the fuck up and just listen, right? Um, So, CryptoPunks were the pioneers in the world of digital collectibles um, and and laid the foundation of what NFTs are. They came out in 2017. They, you know, when they were first launched... They weren't really, like, nobody jumped on them. They weren't collected. It was a slow process as people were kind of, like, navigating this digital world and uh, and the Ethereum network. So each CryptoPunk is a unique 24 by 24 pixel art avatar or a a PFP. You may have heard PFP before. A PFP is a, a profile photo project, right? So... Essentially, as we enter the digital world and your avatar is kind of your digital identity on all these different platforms, um, there's art that can serve as that digital identity. So you've probably heard of Bored Apes. You've probably heard of CryptoPunks. Those are kind of the two most iconic uh, early projects in this space. So... The first point that they serve is proof of digital ownership, scarcity, and and provenance, which we've kind of talked about a little bit with ownership uh, when I talked about gaming NFTs a few podcasts back. But again, in this digital era that we live in, ownership is really the most important thing that we have. And I've talked about this at length because in this digital world, if you don't actually own your assets, then you don't, you have nothing. In the physical world, obviously, you own your house, you're in your house, right? Okay. But on the internet, if you don't actually own and custodian and hold your assets, 
be it art or money, then you don't own it. You don't have it. And you see this again with banks, where the banks don't actually own your money. You don't have your money in the bank. They hold fractionalized reserves of your money. So if everybody goes to get their money at the same time, they don't have it. It's not there. Okay. And we saw this with centralized crypto exchanges like FTX and the whole FTX scandal, which is not a crypto scam. That's a financial scam. So what happened is people had their assets in this centralized bank, essentially, and Sam Bankman Freed was out fucking spending everybody's money, gambling their money, and lost it. He basically Bernie Madoffed their money away. That's not a crypto scam. That's a financial scam. What real digital ownership is, is owning your own assets in your own wallet. I'm not going to dive into this now because it's a pretty lengthy discussion, but crypto punks serve as kind of the first use case, one of the first use cases of owning your own digital art and allowing it to be a marker of identity in this digital world. I'll get into that in a little bit. So what I wanted to do was, because I know everyone's first thought was going to be, why the fuck did you spend so much money on this? What What's the, this isn't real art. What's the significance? So I wanted to draw some comparisons between, you know, the history of art, famous paintings and famous art, and CryptoPunks and other, you know, popular NFT projects that are early on, right? So when you look at historic paintings, they're, they're long revered as like the cultural artifacts of eras. They act as a window into the world of the past, right? If you go to like a, a fucking museum and you see, you know, old art, da 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 da, -da. Um, these works often carry deep meaning, uh, societal values at the time, um, and, and the context and like the narrative behind the art, what was going on that it evoked this or in this era, what was the conversation surrounding the art? Cause that can often make the piece more iconic and, and, and bigger, right? We don't just take art at face value. We, we look to the the cultural context in which it was created because that again can raise a piece of art from oh this is a dope piece of art to holy fuck this is a this is a this is famous this is art right cuz you don't get to define art there's so many variables that make up what is great art and art is subjective but people define the value of art and that is often rooted in the, the conversation surrounding the art. So both crypto punks, crypto punks like these, a lot of these famous paintings have sparked the conversation about what is real art? How is this art? What, what is the, the value of this? And, and if you look at some like famous paintings, they, they did the same thing. Now this is going to sound crazy when I say these names, but bear with me. 1907. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. My French is terrible, but uh, it's a famous Picasso piece. And it challenged the traditional notions of beauty and the beauty standards in the early 1900s. It's a painting of four naked women. And when the piece first came out, everybody was like, what the fuck is this? They were angled and sharp and it was cubism. But it was not the traditional beauty at the time. And a lot of people were like, this looks like shit. This is not art. What the fuck is this? And that conversation, con like those controversies around female figures and how they're depicted and those dialogues about the evolving nature of art is one of the things that allowed that painting to be as revered as it is today and really helped lift Picasso's career. Another great example, Fountain by Marcel Duchamp. This is a sculpture of a urinal. And it, it was a provocative work that challenged, like, what is art? You know, it was submitted, and 
everybody's like, well, what the fuck is this? This isn't art. This is, what is this? <laughs> and he was pressured to withdraw his submission. And it triggered debates around the role of artists, um, the concept of originality, boundaries of artistic expression. And the piece was ultimately not allowed to be entered. I think he even removed it um, just to maintain his own artistic um, pro prowess at the time. And th this conversation helped spark this piece and make it one of the most iconic sculptures to date. Again, it sounds crazy. If you look at it, it looks like a urinal, <laughs> right? But these these controversies and dialogues helped evolve what is art. You don't get to define what art is. Sorry. The best example, I think, is Warhol. And, uh, and the Campbell soup cans, for example. He, you know, Warhol's paintings in this era were just everyday consumer products. And again... It challenged the idea of what high art is and defined a new era of art, really, and pop art in like the modern art era. And it it sparked conversation and debate about consumerism, about, um, you know, the boundaries of art and pop culture, what makes art. And these conversations are what made this art so iconic. It was also, he defined a genre of art, right? And it made Warhol what he is today, which is, I mean, you know, he's one of the fucking greatest. But again, teleport yourself back into that, that era, that era of time. If you looked at the, the Campbell's soup paintings, you'd be like, what the fuck is this? This isn't art. This is just Campbell's soup. Guess what? You would have been wrong. Because <laughs> you don't get to define what art is. So let's look at punks. Punks are 24 by 24, pixel art. And, and they're iconic. And the conversation surrounding them is obviously the controversy of NFTs and scams. And as we enter the digital art era, right, in the traditional art world that we're in today in modern art you know these really are the forward facing first example of digital art of a profile photo generative art project right and then the other controversy surrounding it is how it was made which is you know what a lot of people will say is like, well, Gino, all those paintings that you mentioned previous or sculptures were done by hand. You know, th these are paintings with acrylics and then it, and or a sculpture. And this is, this is digital. This is algorithm generated. These are algorithmically generated pieces of art. Well, generative art embraces the power of code and technology. And I would argue that's what makes it more iconic as we, you know, are beginning to walk hand in hand with AI and with technology and the conversation surrounding is AI pro artist? How do we work in tandem with this technology? Again, this is a great example of that. And, you know, I'm confident in this digitized world, it's something that we're just going to have to, you, you don't have a choice. You can't fight it. And we're already seeing today some of the greatest artists using this technology as a tool, right? And so, you know, as we continue to like fully immerse ourselves in this digital world, ownership and identity is everything. And punks have first mover advantage in both identity and ownership, proving that blockchain can verify ownership of unique digital items, serve as a way of identity and community, and, you know, again, as, as a flex, because art is about the flex. And it's, the value has been defined. We've already had 
so many multi-million dollar sales. It's in museums. They've done auctions at Sotheby's and Christie's. Um, the, the value's been defined. And as we proceed and we shake the stigma of NFTs being a scam, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm convinced that it's going to age very well. You know, there's a woman who bought a Basquiat for like $400. And uh, this is a little bit more than that, but I'm convinced it'll age uh, about the same. So anyway, that was my week. Um, our main topic tonight is one very near and dear to my heart. It is June 25th, 2023. And we have yet to have a number one hip hop rap album on Billboard Hot 200. We have not had a number one for the first time in a decade. The question I keep seeing on the internet, well, really, the statement that I keep seeing on the internet is hip hop is dead, rap is dead. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, hip hop has reigned as the biggest commercial genre in the United States for six years. That number is going up. Um, R&B and hip-hop is up 6% in overall units sold since this time last year. So rap is being consumed more than it was last year and in years prior. So why have we not had a number one? I think there's... A few reasons that we can explain. I think the first and obvious one is that none of the heavy hitters have dropped an album yet. Drake hasn't dropped an album yet. J. Cole hasn't dropped an album yet. Kendrick hasn't dropped an album yet. Cardi B hasn't dropped an album yet. Travis Scott hasn't dropped an album yet. Nicki Minaj hasn't dropped an album yet. Uh, so obviously, going to be tough um, when those people haven't dropped anything yet. Uh, we've had chart stagnation which is essentially there just hasn't been a lot of movement at the top. Um, I think SZA had like a one-week stint at number one, and The Weeknd had a one-week stint at number one. Um, Ariana had a one-week had a one-week stint. But ultimately, the Miley Cyrus album and the Morgan Wallen album have just been at number one. for uh, They haven't left. Um, and that's kept the Hot 100 and the Billboard 200. That's just kind of kept everybody else at bay. Um, I, you know, we, we, we've discussed how tough it is for new acts to break out, especially in rap music. And again, since the heavy hitters haven't dropped any albums, um, we've had some like songs pop up that have done well. All the rap songs that have done well have been kind of like dance records. And I think what's really hurting hip-hop right now and rap right now, and all the fucking old he rap heads are not going to like what I'm about to say. Sorry. But pop music has had this resurgence of dance in the past, like, two years. Especially this year. Um, we're hearing a lot of, like, 80s. A lot of a lot of techno, um, a lot of disco is coming back, and rap music hasn't really adjusted in terms of crossover. The only real like example of rap records that have done super well this year have been like like Uzi. I just want to rock. I just want to rock, 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 body yada yada. Should I got a body yada yada? That's a that's a Jersey, you know. That's a that's a Jersey Club record. Um, Coyle Ray song, Players, Jersey Club record. All the Ice Spice shit, like Pink Pants, Panthers. Um, that boy's a liar. That boy's a liar. That's a dance pop record. That's a synth pop record. It's like kind of bordering on hyper pop. It's a dance song. It's dance. And I think until rap, you know, starts to like stop neglecting the club club and stop pandering to the strip club 
it's going to be tough to break out unless you have a bop. Like, unless you got a fucking record. You know what I'm saying? And I think people... I think people are kind of, like, sample fatigued. Listeners of rap are just... I think they're just kind of getting sick of listening to flips. Uh, you know, it's been... what Every fucking label has been trying to do f- for years. It's been six years. And it's just been samples and flips and flips and flips. And, you know, I was one of the early people that were responsible for this. Uh... <laughs> This this era of sampling old records and just turning them into fucking ratchet rap joints. But I think people are kind of getting tired of it. Um, and that's not to say that people are going to stop sampling because they're not, again. And I think we're going to see, it's just going to be more and more and more. But I think the challenge is going to be, all right, how do you innovate with that sampling? How do you innovate? using that existing IP and plugging it in in a way that sounds different and probably leans more dance friendly. You got to adapt. Labels have not figured out a way to do it yet. And songwriters need to really tap in and and figure out a way to, uh, to do that. So those are my thoughts. Um, No hip hop is not dead. And that's why the main topic today is kind of a shorter one because there's not a discussion to be have here. It's, it's, rap isn't going anywhere. Rap just needs to adapt. And that's a bar. And that rhymes. It's like, I, it's, it's as if I, too, am a songwriter. Um, it's time for everyone's favorite segment, guys. The F-O-H-H-O-F. The Fuck Out of Your Hall of Fame. And this week's inductee into the Fuck Out of Your Hall of Fame is Lance Armstrong. If you don't know who Lance Armstrong is, no, he's not the guy that landed on the moon uh, and did land on the moon. Conspiracy theorists, fuck out of here. Lance Armstrong is one of the most famous, well-decorated bicyclists, cyclists, in the history of bicycling. Uh, He has since retired. And... He's very rich. Now, he was obviously the one who got caught doping and cheating. We'll get into that in a moment. Lance Armstrong tweeted yesterday, Is there not a world in which one can be supportive of the transgender community and curious about the fairness of trans athletes in sport, yet not be labeled a transphobe or bigot as we ask questions? Do we yet know the answers? And do we even want to know the answers? This is all to spark a conversation that Lance Armstrong himself wants to lead. He wants to hold a debate and an open conversation about fairness in sports with trans athletes. Now, this is a fair discussion. And there's points to be made on both sides. But I think we can all agree, Republicans, Democrats, people that support the trans community, transphobes, We can all agree that Mr. HGH himself should probably not be leading the conversation on fairness in sports. We should have this conversation, but Lance fucking Armstrong should probably not be the one having the conversation with us. Hey, guy that cheated in the Tour de France a kajillion times. Hey, guy that had his teammates laying down on the bus giving blood transfusions to him so he could pass his doping tests. Maybe you're not the best guy to lead the conversation on fairness in sports. Maybe we should leave that to, I don't know, any other person on earth more qualified to have that conversation. Lance Armstrong, shut the fuck up and go away. You did it, dude. You cheated, but you're still rich as fuck. Also, you beat cancer, so good on you. That's a feat in itself. And maybe the steroids were played a part in that. I don't know. I haven't done the research. I don't care. Shut the fuck up and stop trying to insert yourself in this conversation just because it's the hottest topic in media right now and in politics. Dude, 
Get the fuck out of here, bro. <laughs> Nobody wants to know your opinion on the fairness in sports. The, the absolute unmitigated gall of you to insert yourself in this conversation and go, hey, you know what? I should be the one to lead this conversation. I mean, fuck out of here, dude. Now, I'm not going to get into this conversation because, A, I don't, f I don't care. It's not my business. And I just, you know, is this what we need to be figuring out as a country? Is this what we all need to be arguing about? Now, you guys know I hate getting political on this show because I'm a straight shooter right, right down the middle. Right down the middle. I'm an independent. Uh, and I just, I just feel like I don't know. This is going to get me in trouble because I'm going to offend a, a shitload of people probably if I keep going down this uh, this rabbit hole. What I will say, everybody, just mind your fucking business. Yeah. Your kids are safe. Everything's fine. They're not brainwashing your children in school just because they're bringing awareness. Right. And uh, there's probably like 10 examples total ever about trans athletes, you know, and it sucks for, you know, the girls that lose, to eat, whatever, you know, it all fucking sucks. I don't know, man. Guys, I don't fucking know. I just, do we have to be arguing about this for years and years and years and years and years? Do we, does any, does it even actually fucking matter? Really? Does it really fucking matter? No, it doesn't. So that's how we're going to end the week or begin the week um, is that we're going to begin the week by just exercising that out of your brains and just love everybody and just shut the fuck up, Lance Armstrong. Um, that's going to do it for this week. Guys, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to leave five stars right fucking now, and I want you to comment something to the effect of, this podcast changed my life, or this is the best podcast I've ever heard, or Gino the Ghost is the most handsome, well-articulated podcaster in the podcast business. Something to that effect. Now, I just gave you a few good ideas and good starters to go off of. It'll take you a couple of seconds. Go ahead and do that, and then do the equivalent on YouTube and on Spotify of that, uh, because again, we're growing the podcast and we're trying to take over the world, and I need your help. Okay, so go ahead and do that. And I want to thank you for listening to Good Luck this week. Good night and good luck. Good night and good luck. You smile and say goodbye to me, but I don't give a fuck. You hop in the Uber, off to your future. Good night and good luck. You try to play your cards with me, but I'm calling your bluff. Because it wasn't enough. Mm, good night and good luck.